listening to the Fit Mind, Fit Body podcast, where we explore the connection between a fit body and positive mental health. And our big mission, it's to help 10,000 runners to develop fitter minds in the next two years. I'm your host, Michelle Frost. Let's get moving. Welcome to this episode of the Fit Mind Fit Body Podcast, where we talk to Kate Edwards. This is a fascinating conversation where Kate talks about her lifelong chronic fatigue and how she deals with that while still running multi day events, currently training for an Ironman, and doing a PhD. Enjoy. Today on Fit Mind Fit Body, we both get, or we all get, to make a new friend. This is Kate Edwards. Kate, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you Thanks so for much for me. coming along. Yeah, we've got a mutual friend who's dobbed you in. He <laughs> has. <laughs> good of him. Thanks, Kate. Um, <laughs> I appreciate it. I'm not sure if Kate does at the moment, but she will soon, I'm sure. So, Kate, tell us a little bit about yourself. Obviously, you don't have a Tasmanian accent. Tell us a bit about your background. Where do you come from? No, but I'm, I'm interested to know where you think my accent is from. <laughs> but I, um, I actually was born in Canberra. Really? Um, yes, yes. I, I grew up there uh, until I was about 10 or 11, so till the end of year five. Yeah. And then I moved to Sydney. Yeah. And I grew up in Sydney. Um, lived there till about 20, no, when was it? 2002, 2003, I think. And then I moved overseas. Yes. Um, so I've been away for about 16 years. I lived in, um, the first move was to China, then to Malaysia, India, Hong Kong, uh, and then I moved to London. And I was in London for, ooh, I don't know, about eight years, I think. Um, and then I moved to Tasmania at the beginning of 2018. Oh, wow. I can definitely pick up the um, the London. And because, but, yeah. <laughs> I don't know about you, I have a, a a British parent, so my father's from Britain, and so whenever I spend any time either with people with a thick, you know, British accent, or I'm over there for a little while, I pick up very quickly. I don't know if that's because I've had, you know, such exposure to somebody with a yeah. British accent. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure where it came from. I, I get accused of being British a lot. Yeah, you do. <laughs> um, I think I sound extremely Australian, but yeah, not everyone agrees with me. So Fergus, my husband, thinks he's he's no. You are. You sound Australian, but a lot of other people like that. Who, where are you from? So British people yeah. would say you probably sound very Australian. Australian. <laughs> Only like. <laughs> yeah. Um. All right, so let's go back to Canberra. So you were in Canberra uh, for, was it like primary school, Lee taught us when you were young? Yeah, primary school up to the end of year five. And yeah. did you do much sport in primary school? Oh, typical stuff, I guess. Um, yeah, just school sports, whatever we were forced into. So yeah. swimming lessons, running around the oval. Yeah. Um, we were always pretty active as kids. So yeah. growing up. Um, our suburb, which is now very much the centre of Canberra, it used to be on the outskirts. So it was a brand new suburb. I think one, our house was one of the first houses in the street. So it was, there was a lot of new families moving up there. So oh, wow. lots of kids around. And we we spent our whole lives outside. You know, we'd, we'd leave it in the morning and we'd come back at night um, and we'd be off on our bikes or running around the suburbs um, doing whatever kids get up to. So, yeah, it was effective. We were um, used to do a fair bit of camping and hiking as a kid as well mm-hmm. yep so pretty yeah, active just, just, yeah yeah an active family as well by the sound of it yeah. mm, not really <laughs> I think we were active as kids and my parents tried to do what they could with us yeah. but they never did any sort of structured sport that I can remember um no one ever ran or cycled or, or did a sport Sport. I think you know. I think Mum probably did hockey at school. Um, yeah. I don't. I actually don't remember Dad ever talking about sport. Um, so did they play yeah, just, or yeah, they would. Yeah, we would go bushwalking, but when we were quite small, so mm. I, I think probably the distances we were doing were not very yeah. <laughs> large. Um, and because we lived in Canberra, it wasn't too far from national parks and things, so we would um, just pop what, out there. Why were you in Canberra? Your parents. Um connected to the political world or some other reason? Uh, no, um, my 
my mum's family was my mum grew up in Sydney my dad grew up in Melbourne um, but they both went to ANU or ACU and yeah. um, that's where they met at university anyway in so, Canberra yeah. so yeah mum was a teacher dad yeah. was a chemist at that time uh, so they yeah bought us up in Canberra oh, wow. um, and then dad changed jobs and then that's hence the move to Sydney. I have spoken on the podcast to a friend of ours who used to live in Tasmania who now lives in Canberra. <laughs> Okay. There you go. <laughs> yeah, it's a weird thing. If people say, where are you from? I generally say Sydney. I don't often admit to the Canberra connection, um, but that's just more convenience rather than having to say, yeah, I'm yeah. here, then I moved. But, yeah, I mean, it's a it was a great place for a kid to grow up. We had like, plenty of space to run around. Sort of a small town kind of vibe to it. I've, never, I've only visited, never, never yeah. been there for very long, but um, it just has that small town, but city kind of vibe to it, which is kind of nice. Yeah, and I think it's changed a lot um, since I lived there. We, I've still got a lot of family there, cousins yeah. there, and <clears throat> moving, going back to visit once we moved back to Australia, I was surprised at how much it had grown up as a city. Okay. So it's, it's, it's quite a fun place to go now, but, yeah, when I was growing up, there wasn't, there wasn't much there. <laughs> it's a bit boring. Because it does yeah. feel kind of like a new, <laughs> like if you think of cities in Australia, my brain says Canberra is quite a new place. Like it's not, yeah. you know, the establishment of Hobart and Sydney and, and Melbourne it just hasn't have that. But um, yeah, anyway, that's really yeah. cool. And so then you moved to Sydney and you did your high school and whatever there. Yep. Um, did you do much sport in high school? Yeah, yeah, reasonable amount. Again, just sort of the typical things that you're yeah. sort of forced to do. So <laughs> um, school, you know, swimming, I, um, I, I've never been a particularly good swimmer. But mm-hmm. I think by the time I was in year 12, I was the girls' captain of the swimming team. Wow. Um, mostly because I probably cheered the loudest <laughs> rather than could actually swim the fastest. Um, played hockey, netball. Um, played a lot of sport at lunchtime. So in year 11 and year 12, I went to an all-girls school between 7 and 10 and then went to a co-ed school year 11 and 12. Mm-hmm. And throughout year 11 and 12, um, a girlfriend and myself went and played touch football on the oval with the boys um sitting around just eating lunch kind of wasn't our thing so um yeah we'd wear bike pants under our skirts and take them off at lunch and just play awesome. touch football um so always always pretty active but nothing ever particularly you know structured or yeah um yeah, yeah. so obviously like Sports. saying that to me makes me think that as you said you weren't um the kind of girls who just wanted to sit around and eat lunch and gossip or whatever girls do <laughs> Um, or in uh, in college uh, years, you you were somebody who wanted to move, or you enjoyed that kind of yeah, what was going on with your body, I suppose at the time that that wanting to move, which is kind of a cool thing, I think. Definitely, yeah, yeah. Um, do you have what siblings do you have? Do you have? I have an younger? older sister and a younger brother. Okay, and did they used to have a similar kind of sporting? background to you just you know what what we needed to do at school and that kind of thing pretty much yeah my sister and I played hockey together for a few years and I think that was convenient for mum and dad so that um yeah. and my brother's playing you know football or whatever so yeah they could take us in one direction him in the other direction um so yeah yeah being being a mum of five um the convenient bit as to what sport they were going to do I can only imagine <laughs> every <Emmy's about. laughs> thinking it oh, maybe yes, you all need I... to play this sport <laughs> mostly they're all coming running with me <laughs> lovely <laughs> it's like the basis for everything <laughs> you know a little bit of running and they'll be fine um obviously well not obviously did you what did you do when you finished college what was your did you go to university did you start work what did you do I did um just as I was about to, so I finished year 12, and just as mm. I was about to start university, I came down with glandular fever quite badly oh, no. um, and spent about four months in bed. Um, oh. It hit me really, really badly. Um, so I had I had deferred university for that year because there was mm-hmm. nowhere I could, I could go. So I spent that year essentially recovering from that, um, which took a while, but got, got there. But I think after that, um, sort of had post-viral fatigue and I've had since then I've had chronic fatigue yeah essentially yeah well, ever since I've had that so for my whole life yeah so that's hard isn't it that's I mean obviously that's hard I've, I've heard that a lot though when people yeah. get something like glandular fever or Ross River River virus or one of those that that can um, become a lifelong problem with chronic fatigue and, and the like. yeah 
having to deal with that. Oh, so then, so you, you had the year to get over that and then you went to mm-hmm. university after that year? Yeah, off? I did, yeah. I assume there wasn't much sport in your getting over glandular fever. Like, <laughs> not, not unless you count going out dancing every Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Oh, night. that kind of sport. <laughs> that, was, that was probably my main activity um, as soon as I was well enough to be able to go, which was, killed my parents because I was like, seriously. <laughs> that is pretty physical. I can yeah, remember. Yeah, and I would, I would spend a lot of time sleeping after that. But um, yeah, but apart from that, no, uh, I started uni. Um, it didn't leave much time. I think I started dabbling a little bit in triathlon. Um, yeah. I was dating a boy at the time who mm-hmm. had started, and triathlon was still quite a new sport at that stage, and he had started training for them. So he's like, oh, you should come along. And I, I was never a particularly good runner. I wasn't a great swimmer, particularly like freestyle-wise. Um, I'd never ridden a bike. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, so apart just- from, you know, <laughs> as a kid out on the, you know, out on the street. So yeah. Yeah. Um, he, he bought me a, a bike. Uh, which I think cost all of $100 at the time. Oh. Um, and then I sort of joined in the local triathlon club for some swimming and running. So I did a, maybe three sprint triathlons um, out at Cornell the early on Sunday mornings. Um, and then we broke up and that was the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this was while you were at university? This is while I was at yeah. uni, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was quite involved. I don't know how it started, but I ended up being quite involved in the athletics club there. So I ended up being secretary and then president of the athletics club at uni. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I'm not sure how or why. Wasn't a boy. Um, yeah, but but was quite involved with other people doing sport. Okay. So I went to the uni games in Canberra. Um, I played I played um, water polo at the university games yeah. uh, for the university. Yeah. Um, yeah, just but just was always kind of active, but not really anything serious so you weren't you didn't sort of stick to say water polo or try no, I was I wasn't good enough at anything to, to stick to it just enjoyed giving That's... anything a crack really someone said do you want to try this I'm like sure okay. what were you studying at uni uh, I did a science degree what science um so predominantly biology and chemistry um but I actually majored in psychology awesome <laughs> a bit like my daughter who's in her last year of a double degree in zoology and drama oh fabulous <laughs> awesome combination yours, yours almost go together <laughs> like, <laughs> really interesting um, so why do you think you found yourself um enmeshed in a lot of these sporting things when you were when you were at uni but you you didn't grab any of them and just run with them you just seemed to enjoy like what was it with that being involved and participating, you know, you, you obviously didn't care that much whether you um, were the best at it because that wasn't part of it by the sound of it. You just wanted to be part to enjoy it. So, I think, yeah, I think that's it. It was just, it was just I'm happy to give anything I crack once, really. <laughs> um, I probably have commitment problems. So <laughs> sticking with anything was probably an issue. Oh, that's but, why you studied psychology. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> understand that more <laughs> um, but yeah I think it was just more the enjoyment and you know different groups of people did different things and I I had quite a range of different friends doing different things so it was more just um, I am it's even worse in the, I mean we didn't have email or internet <laughs> back when I was you know growing up in at uni um, so I was always terrible at keeping in contact so that was my way of of seeing people and, and just remaining friends with them because they were yeah. doing these different things that I'd be involved in. Yeah. Oh, I love that's a great, um, a great reason to be, to be involved like that, mm. continuing the human connection with each other without having to, um, you know, commit too much. Yeah. <laughs> <Just cool. Yep. laughs> or, you know, to remember to have the coffee date or whatever it is. So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, you finished uni and did your work life start in Sydney or did you go overseas yep. almost straight away? No, it started in Sydney. Um, I was working um, working in Sydney, so that mm-hmm. kind of put a dent in um, extra time. Sydney is a big place and your commute mm-hmm. can take a long time. So I think um, a lot of my hours were taken up <clears throat> getting to and from work. Yeah. But, yeah, again, just, just stayed doing some regular stuff. Again, uh, one of the companies I worked for there was an oval next door and um, some of the young engineers would go down and play touch football at lunchtime so a couple of times a week I would join them and go play touch football at lunchtime oh, that's awesome. um, and then at one stage I was living 
in a share house with three boys that I went to school with and one of them uh, was a very good hockey player and so he well, I probably got us all very drunk one night and convinced us all to sign up and so we started playing hockey as well just um just on a weekend but yeah some indoors some training so I was really hockey I know, four times a week just you know nothing serious completely recreational but enjoying it um and then was convinced to try giving goalkeeping a go because they 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 were missing a goalkeeper for the yeah. third grade and I'm like okay sure <laughs> so I became goalie for a couple of years um which probably wasn't that active but was extremely enjoyable because you, you continue that social element, don't you? Like exactly. Somewhere to be yeah. three or four times well, a week, and I'm exactly. In role. You know. <laughs> and in winter, you can rug up because you're the goalie, so you can wear like multiple layers and then just yeah. hang around the back, talk with people. It was fabulous. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it all so, what did you do? Like with your degree, what what work did you do when you first left um, uni? So, I the degree that I did probably wasn't the degree that I wanted to do, but I was encouraged to do it. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I finished, I guess the opportunities with the psychology were to move into sort of that HR um, sort of field. And I had done some um, work experience with Boeing. So Boeing, the American plane company Mm -hmm. in Australia, they work with defense telecommunications rather than planes and they were just up the road and actually my, my dad worked for them so he'd got me some um, work while I was at uni and one day I was working in a particular area and I met um, the man who became one of my mentors and he's kind of said you know what are you doing here anyway I, I think at that stage I was probably wrapping secret documents to be sent somewhere and he seemed to think I had a great enthusiasm for wrapping wrapping these documents up because anyone who knows me I love wrapping presents Anyway, I was, I was, yeah. So anyway, we had a, a bit of a chat, and he said, "Would you be, you know, would you like a job?" Essentially, and he asked if he offered me a job. So I ended up working for Boeing for wow. oh, quite a few years, um, but in their defence telecoms side yep. um, with project management. So yeah, moved into telecoms project management. Um, yeah, completely nothing to do with my degree. <laughs> <laughs> and is that is that what you moved overseas with as well, or with that type, um, type of role? No, that was the, that's a different story. <laughs> so, story. <laughs> yeah. So, with the telecoms side of things, uh, that's how I had a few different jobs. Um, I, including working for IBM for the Olympics, so I worked at um, at Sydney for the 2000 Olympics. Yeah, I so lived I was in part. Sydney then. It was a great time to be in other. Sydney. <laughs> it was a wonderful time. <laughs> I believe it. It was. Um, so I worked down just next to the stadium every day, and that was oh, that was a great job. But when that finished, so cool. um, it was I was looking for something else to do. Um, but through that, uh, ended up with another company and met the man who actually became who is now my ex husband. Um, but he was also working in the telecommunications space, and it was his job that um, he got. Uh, an offer to be posted overseas so like yeah sure um and that was China that's the first move Shanghai and so did yeah. you work when you were there or you just you didn't no it, it couldn't um couldn't. The visa restrictions yeah. meant I couldn't yeah. so yeah and how long were you in China for uh yeah 12 months okay and what did you yeah. think of it how was that it was um, topical now <laughs> yeah it is um oh it, fabulous I loved it um, I one of the first things I did was go to the university and start learning Chinese, oh, wow. and that that made everything much more accessible to me because yeah. when I first arrived, very few people spoke English, mm-hmm. um, and I couldn't speak Chinese, and I felt like a baby who couldn't do anything. I couldn't yeah. go to the shop and ask for what I wanted. I, I I didn't know how to get around in the taxi. I nothing. Um, so that that was a really important step for me to be able to understand where I was at. Um, but yeah, absolutely loved it. Did you do any sport while you were there or any? No, um, no, I walked a lot. Yeah. So essentially from the time I moved overseas to the time we moved back to Tasmania, I didn't own a car for those 16 years. So <laughs> every city I've been in, um, I've done a lot of walking uh, yeah. and, and like the first day, that I moved there I was by myself and I, I walked out the door and I turned right to go around the block and I was yeah. going to cross the road and there were cars and there were people and there were things up above me and 
I could not even, I was terrified of even crossing the road. <laughs> so I just did a lap of the block. <laughs> I went back to the hotel. And then the next day I got a bit braver. I went out and, you know, you learn to deal with all of that stuff. But you it do. was, um, yeah, yeah, just, just a lot of walking. I think at one point I probably joined a gym, but since I didn't have a clue what I was doing, I didn't um, go there very often. <laughs> so, yeah, walking was probably my main form of exercise. I think. So, so from China, where did you find yourself? Um, after China, Malaysia. And so these are all jumps overseas that you did with your ex-husband? Correct. Yeah, yeah. Like with his work. So his, with work, his work took yeah. him lots of places, yeah? Yeah. And took you there as well. So you yeah. went to Malaysia. Where did you, I guess, which country did you, I've done a bit of travelling. Which country did you like the best? Oh, <laughs> such a difficult question. I have... I have loved everywhere I've been for different reasons. Um, there are reasons why I wouldn't go back and live in certain places, but that's not because they weren't amazing. It's just mm. because of some of the restrictions they put on kind of what it is you want to do at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but all of them for different reasons. Just uh, There is nothing that I would not go back and do. Yeah. Were you in Kuala Lumpur? In I was, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And how long were you there for? So Kale was... Nearly two years, I think. Yeah, I think that was nearly two years. And it was in Kale that I started to do some climbing. So um, I met a, a friend there and uh, she said, oh, you should come climbing with us. And there was a, a really fantastic indoor centre. So we went rock climbing, some indoor, did some outdoor. And then um, while we were there, I took a trip to Pakistan to do a mountaineering trip. Wow. And that was probably the first long long thing that I'd done so that was a oh, almost a month I think um and that involved a big long trek up a glacier to do some mountaineering um, and some climbing yeah wow that would have been so exciting that it was fantastic it's the first time I've ever been shot at oh not so, <laughs> so exciting that bit. <laughs> at one point we um at one point we needed a guide um yeah, uh, so we're in a in the van traveling, and we needed a, an armed guard with us because there were pot shots being taken at us from the <laughs> from mountain somewhere. Yeah. So that was exciting, but um, that was a fantastic trip. You did. I think that, that was the first yeah. time you've been shot at. Does that mean you've been shot at multiple, <laughs> multiple times? <laughs> Things I'm probably not going to admit on a podcast. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> But um, yeah, so that I think, but I think that first trip was the first time that I thought I can, I can do something that is a bit beyond what I ever thought that I would yeah. do. Yeah. I wasn't, um, you know, I'd been involved in you know, a lot of sports, as I'd said, you know, hockey and whatever. But um, this whole other world out there of, of mountaineering and trekking and hiking, yeah. Um, yeah, that that sort of opened up to me on that trip and. Yeah, had a ball. It was fantastic. That being able to take yourself what seems like a long way using and to amazing places, but using yeah. just your body as the, yeah. you know, the energy or whatever to get there rather than a vehicle or or, or some other means, I think is so empowering often. It is. The first few times that you do it, it continues yeah. to amaze me <laughs> how, far, how far we can go and what we can do. And that's, that's the body. thing. I think um, part of the trek was up to a place called Snow Lake, which is outside of the polar ice caps it's the largest ice cap in the world and it is just this huge expanse of ice and we were sitting up on top of a mountain that's like six thousand meters just looking down over this ice cap and just thinking yeah I got here if, if I hadn't been able to do this on my own two legs there's no way I would have ever seen this and it was just wow. yeah it's phenomenal really enjoyed that it. is amazing um, so you were in Malaysia. Where did you go to next? This is like a trip around the world with Kate. <laughs> uh, then I moved to India, to Mumbai. Yeah. Yep. And I was in Mumbai for hmm, two, two years in Mumbai as well, I think. Okay. Was that, did that feel Three. a lot different from Kuala Lumpur? Oh. I haven't done India yeah. at all. Yeah, so from Shanghai to KL, KL felt very much like a big country town after living in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. And then it was back to the madness again in Mumbai. Mumbai was just, yeah, <clears throat> similar to it to Shanghai and it's just busyness, but yeah. completely different feel to it. Yeah, different culture sort of. Yeah. yeah. But both yeah. quite warm. I, well, I don't know, is Shanghai? Yeah. Uh, Shanghai gets, uh, it gets very hot in summer okay. um, and very cold in winter. So okay. it often... It, 
it is a big enough city that the snow doesn't settle, but it does often snow in winter. But we had multiple weeks of 40 degrees plus in summer. Yeah. Wow, hot. <laughs> did, yeah. So did you do um, more, um, what is it, mountaineering when you were in India? Um, I had less of an opportunity there um, and that that was just more for personal reasons than anything else. Um, but it's probably where I started the occasional run and that was only ever on a treadmill <laughs> in a gym. Um, running outside wasn't very much an option there. Yeah. But yeah, it still, still kind of kept up with some hiking and climbing when I could, but the opportunities were just a bit more limited. Yeah. it's something that I think a lot of people who haven't sort of traveled to especially Asian cultures and I guess the Middle East sort of areas that just being able to step out the door and go for a run is just not possible in some of those no. places having been to some of them um, or depending on the reason it's not possible I would have to go with my husband like literally would have to run with him because it just wasn't safe for a woman to yeah. run by herself but and some places it just isn't possible even for the two of us to have, to have run for different reasons, which we often yeah. don't think about living in, in our kind of Western world. We just think we everyone can step out the door and go for a run, but that's not always the case. Yeah, not the case. Um, yeah, and, it's, and it, yeah, as I say, it depends on the culture. And, um, it, yeah, it just wasn't – I never saw anybody jogging at all or running in Mumbai, mm. um, not just as for the fact that it's just so busy 24 hours a day that you're always stopping at streets and there's just so that it's very hard to get a, just a gentle run in with nothing in your way um but yeah as a as a western female there's no way I could have just stepped out of the door and sting in the shorts and, and gone for a run where I lived I did I mentioned in a podcast recently a couple of podcasts ago we went for a run in the Philippines um sort of in the country at one point, um, Simon and I, and it, and it wasn't a place where you felt unsafe um, at all, but all of the villagers just looked at us and laughed, pointed and laughed, because yeah. like, oh, why are you running if you don't have to? Like, you're not running to catch a bus and you're not running to, mm -hmm. or a tuk-tuk or whatever. Um, and you're, you're not running away from something, so why on earth are you running? <laughs> just, yeah. and, you, and you're not five, <laughs> you're not five years old, so why are you running? So it was quite funny. So culturally, just, you know, they don't understand uh, why why we would do it because I suppose in a lot of those cultures also um, their work is often very manual too the temperature is also quite warm so yeah. if you're it's kind of a manual thing to be out running and, and really they all aspire to just um, not have to be always being physical I suppose yeah absolutely I think and I think we're in a quite a privileged position where we can mm. We can say we do this purely for the enjoyment and the fun of it exactly. because we, we don't have to be, you know, working hard all day physically every day. Like we do this because we don't have to do that. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's fascinating um, in in all many in many levels to to think about. I think. All right, so you were you were in India, and where did you go next after uh, Hong Kong? After that. Ah. Another busy place. <laughs> another busy place. Yep, and another warm place. <laughs> um, so Hong Kong, um, yeah. What yeah. year were you in Hong Kong? Two thousand. I think I moved there in two thousand seven. Yeah. From two thousand seven to two thousand ten, I think. Okay. So did you find Hong yeah. Kong much different from some oh, of these other places? Yeah, completely different again. Mm. Yeah. Because yeah. like we've got some family history there. I haven't been there myself, but both. Mm -hmm my husband and my family have had um, some history where people have gone to live there for a little while. And I've, yeah, it, it, before it's, you know, returned to China in recent times, it seemed like quite a mix of, of Western and, and Chinese cultural sort of mixed together. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is, was, and it's, um, mm. I, I loved it. Um, I, I could quite happily have, have lived there for a lot longer, but um, moved on to the UK, but it, uh, Hong Kong, we think of as being as this massively big place, big city, but it's tiny uh, and it's all like particularly on Hong Kong Island, it's all squished into this small place and the rest of the island is just a big mountain. So it has the most amazing trails and you can, on the Hong Kong side, there is a 50k trail that goes from one side of the island to another from east to west yep. and there's another trail that goes from south to north. So, you know, wow. you, you could just spend plenty of time outside hiking or running um, and then on the 
northern on the new territory side so up on the mainland side there is what they call the Maclehose trail and that was a trail it's about 100k and that was used by the Gurkhas for their training oh, wow. so years ago Oxfam set up a race along this um, trail which is now you know the Oxfam trail walker which is in a lot of different countries and yeah. the idea of that was to do it in teams and you support each other and the company that I started working for in Hong Kong had a um, had a corporate entrant to that and it's so hard to get into that if you lose if you don't go one year you you lose your, you lose your spot. entrance mm-hmm. yeah so the, the, the first year that I started at this company uh, no one really wanted to do it and that they were going to lose a spot and I'm like well, that sounds like fun <laughs> so <laughs> I'm like it's 100k I'm like eh. um so I think uh, there was, it was a friend's birthday party one night um, and as these things usually happen, you know, a lot of people got very drunk and signed up to do it, um, which they then couldn't get out of. So we had a team together and I think, um, and that sort of probably kicked off my long oh, wow. um, association with sort of the ultra running thing. But um, we, yeah, we got a team together and we did the 100K trail walker and I just loved it. So you you walk, ran the whole thing just walked walked the whole thing as a team just the four of us yep um it took us about 30 hours (laughs) I was Um, I was actually signed up to do it in Sydney last year that COVID cancelled it yeah yeah it's yeah COVID's yeah put a um I know a hold on a lot of things (laughs) but um it was it was fabulous and it was just it was a lot of fun to do and um yeah I just I think that was I felt so good after doing it um, that I just, I really enjoyed it. Mean, you start on the Saturday, we finished on the Sunday and I was back at work in high heels on the Monday. I just, I felt really good after having done it. I thought, oh, this is something I really quite enjoy. So, and Hong Kong was great for all of that stuff. So many people go out hiking and running. Um, the, the culture is very much there for them. So did, did you then continue, what period or what part through your time in Hong Kong did you do the 100K? So that was early, oh, it was about the middle of the time that I was there. So that must have been towards the end of 2008 um, and going through this process. So by that stage, um, the marriage had finished and I would moved out. Um, but then I had also met my now husband, uh, Fergus, and he had been sort of in our social group and he'd kind of done a few hikes with us and what have you and, and supported us throughout Trail Walker. And when I finished Trail Walker, he said to me, oh, you should come for a run with me. And I'm like, I don't, don't run. He's I like, walk you, 100K, but yeah, I'm mountain, he's but like, I you can, if you, Yeah, exactly. If you can walk 100K, you can go for a run. I'm like, eh, I don't. <laughs> anyway, so I did a few gentle runs and then there is a particular street in Hong Kong, which is about the only flat pedestrianized place that you can run and it's 4k and he said well let's go and do Bowen Road a few times like sure so one of the first runs we did was 24k along Bowen Road so it was up and back (laughs) three times and we went out and on the first within the first 4k my foot started to hurt a little bit and sort of so then we got back so at the end of 8k I was kind of limping a bit he's like you're okay I'm like oh yeah my foot's just a bit sore he's like, sure I'm like yeah no all good all good so we ended up going up and back and up and back 24k later um we finished and I was very much limping on the way back to the um to the flat he's like you sure right like, oh, no no it's okay my foot's just a bit sore it was really sore <laughs> but there was no way I was going to admit that um anyway I said okay I'll just give it a few days to settle down and then a few days later I tried to go up for a run again and I couldn't um Mm. and even again I think a week after that kind of got 100 meters up the road and was almost in tears I was like this is really painful went to the doctor MRI stress fracture so yeah um so that was my first attempt at running (laughs) and here you are now on a running podcast (laughs) (laughs) um but yeah that was that was the start of not a great year so I ended up with I ended up with two calcaneal stress fractures that year. Plus, I then broke my toe by kicking a <laughs> kicking a thing, a furniture thing. Um, so I didn't. I almost didn't run at all in in two thousand nine. Um, and then in two thousand ten, we moved to London. And just after we moved there, I did my first 
Ultra, which was the Sahara race, the 250k Sahara race. So you spent all of 2009 recovering from various injuries to your feet uh -huh. and, and having only just started running anyway, like literally just started running. Um, because mind you, I think the base level of fitness you would get from mountain climbing, climbing and 100k walk and whatever training you did for that walking, um, that would have given you quite a, a level of fitness, at least in 2008. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and precisely. And, and honestly, the, the the Sahara race, the first one I did, I, I walked most of it anyway. So I wasn't, you How know, I was, was never it? going out there to run it. 250k, but it's over. But it's a multi-day race, so okay. self-sufficient. So you've got to carry everything in your pack. So your pack mm -hmm. weighs somewhere between seven and nine kilograms. But um, yeah, it's over sort of six days. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Where do you sleep? Do they put up tents and things? In there? Yeah, they put up tents. Um, so you sleep in a tent usually somewhere between around eight people per tent yeah um yeah and is there do they provide food sorry no this curious no you take your own food no no you take your own food uh they provide the tent and they provide water and that's okay. it so you everything else you need for the week you carry yourself so, you, so in that seven to eight kilos you've got your food any clothes that you might need as well i guess yeah and maybe yeah. a sleeping bag or a, sleep a sleeping bag, bag sleeping mat um and anything else you need so you've, you've usually got to take a small sort of medical kit yeah. um there are mandatory equipment things you have to take um you know like a spoon and a bowl and all sorts of things yeah everything you need for that week what an adventure yeah. great great so what made you think to sign up to that oh uh, yeah that's all fergus's fault okay so when, <laughs> when i first met him he he had already done one of these races um yeah. And was about to do a second one, and then, and then yeah, as we as we were moving to London, he was going to do uh, Sahara. So he said, "Well, why don't you come with me?" Uh, really? Right. It's like, yeah, you'll be fine. So I'm like, sure I'll be fine, just like I was fine with the broken foot when I started running with you. Um, but yeah, it's it, it was it was a great thing to do, and actually that was that that race he didn't finish. So the Sahara. Um, that year was really hot. The first couple of days mm -hmm. were 50, 50 degrees. And because we started near a, a wadi, near a, a big body of water, it was extremely humid. So it's about 90% humidity and about mm -hmm. 50 degrees Celsius. And the first two days were horrifically difficult. And um, he, Fergus came in, oh, he was definitely within the top 10 that first day. Yeah. And then overnight got really ill and had heat stroke. So he was vomiting all night. Um, and we well so together we walked the first stage of the next day and he had to pull out at the the first checkpoint um and just yeah couldn't couldn't go on and I had been completely unprepared for this race in terms of what knowing what I was doing and I had completely the wrong shoes and these shoes laid in so much sand and so we get to the first checkpoint on the second day and Fergus is, is done he had heat stroke he was you know on his back and, and he's like you should go on and I was like oh do I, I can't just leave you here he's like of course you can there's doctors there's the tech, you, I'm absolutely fine you should continue and I said okay um can I have your shoes he just looked at me he's like do you have like the same <laughs> shoe size no yeah, well yes I have reasonably big feet um his are slightly bigger than mine but not so much bigger that it made a, a big difference and oh, wow. so I took his shoes which were much better than mine and um and finished the race and I think that's the only reason I actually got through that whole one is because I that's took his amazing. shoes but yeah that's amazing so yeah. how did you feel at the end of that it's obviously I heard I spoke to Pat Farmer a few weeks ago and uh, he was saying one of the things he likes about these ultra ultra distances is the fact that it basically tears you down and but by the end of the race you've built yourself back up again so it's that kind yeah. of you know really getting in touch with yourself I suppose in that you know it's it's very hard <laughs> I suppose. yeah I think and I think the the Pakistan trip taught me this quite early on and I think it's just been reinforced to me over the years is that I tend to get stronger as I go along so mm -hmm. for these multi-day races yeah the first few days are hard and then I'm I'm always a lot stronger at the end mm -hmm. so by the time I was finishing the Sahara race the last day was a 90k 90k stage and I felt great that day and then I just I was <laughs> I was going, I wasn't going to run it. Um, I was just keeping up a really good, strong, steady pace walking. And I was, yeah, really, really enjoying it. And 
I was about 20K into this 90K and my one of my tent mates um, said to me, look, you're keeping, I'm feeling really terrible, but you're keeping up a strong pace. Do you mind if I walk with you just to try and keep myself going? I'm like, sure, no problem. Stay with me. So then he started to chat to me and he kept telling me about these stories about he had a mate who used to run marathons with him and they'd always run together until the last bit when his mate would run off and leave him and he'd have to finish these races alone. And then he'd say, oh, but you can go if you want to. <laughs> okay <laughs> um, and his feet were in such a bad way he had terrible terrible blisters and I felt really bad about leaving him so I didn't so I stayed with him the whole the whole of this 90k um, at one point there was a checkpoint that I stayed out a bit longer just to let him go ahead yeah. and I it was oh, I don't know it must have been like 11 o'clock at night or something and it was the clearest brightest night and the stars were out and I just ran until I caught up with him because it was just such a joyful I felt strong. It was a beautiful, cool night for the first time in <laughs> like, like a week. Um, and it was just, I felt strong and happy. And I just really enjoyed that, that brief moment of running. And then I caught up to him and <laughs> had to stay with him. And oh my gosh, he was walking along and every step was like, ow, ow, oh. ow. Oh, it was <laughs> and I was so tired by the end of it that I was hallucinating as we came into the, the camp. And we got to the checkpoint, um, so then they're all welcoming us in and everything, and and they said, "So how was that?" And he turned to the <laughs> turned to the organisers and he says, "That was the worst night I've ever spent with a woman." <laughs> no, <laughs> and I get what he meant, and he was trying to make a joke, but I'm like, seriously, <laughs> you're but, like, um, I wish I had that line. It's yeah. Way it's gone. It's <laughs> yeah, what's so fun for me either? <laughs> um, but yeah, it was. Uh, I just, I genuinely enjoyed the longer distance and going for that. I, I, I kind of, I don't even remember how long it took me now, but it must have been, I don't know, 12 hours, 14 hours. I, I don't even know, um, 16 hours maybe. Um, I just felt great at the end of it and I just really enjoyed it. Yeah. So, so you're still in, you're in, living in London. You've gone off and you've done this crazy thing. Do you come back and, and continue to train for more crazy things and, How's that worked? Um, so I, I I don't really remember. I think 2011, I pretty much had the year off. I was mm -hmm. working um, and I was working quite hard and commuting was taking up a long time. So I don't think I did very much. This The, the Sahara race is part of the Four Desert Series, which is at that time was the Sahara, the Gobi, the Atacama and Antarctica. Mm -hmm. And to get to Antarctica, you had to have done at least two, if not three, of the other, the other races. Yeah. So that was the last desert, and mm -hmm. you could only do that if you'd done the other ones. And Fergus had already done, I think, all the other three. Mm -hmm. And so he was keen to do Antarctica in 2012, and I'd only done one. So I was like, okay, I have to do at least one more um, if I want to get to go to Antarctica, because obviously we may as well go together. Um, so in 2012, I did all three that I hadn't done. So I did the and I did Atacama, then Gobi, and then we went to Antarctica in 2012. Wow, mm. that's a little crazy. It seems from a distance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, three in one year was big. Um, um, did you have yeah. to like if maybe you had to train before you did the first one of that year? And then after that, the the events themselves were they more of the training? More of the training, be? yeah. <laughs> so I think Atacama and Gobi were pretty close together. So, um, so I was still reasonably fit from Atacama and just had to maintain that before I went to Gobi. And then there was a nice break after Gobi before going to Antarctica. Wow, what was it like to go to Antarctica? Oh, horrific! Well. Okay, in and of itself, Antarctica is amazing. And if you ever get a chance to go there, go. But I was so horrifically seasick that um, the journey itself was not. Oh, you have to fun. go on. So you go on a We went on a boat. boat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So it was a couple of days down there over the Great Drake Passage. So we flew into Argentina to Ushuaia. And then yeah. from Ushuaia, I took the boat over to Antarctica. And um, yeah. And how, how many people run this race? Um, I think. Oh, that's a good question. I think they get, they only run it every two years, I think, and they might get around 50 people. Yeah. 
maybe yeah, yeah I, that's a complete guess yeah you'd think it'd be quite limited anyway like just because of the environment and yeah you know, all running having been an event um director before and I'm just thinking gosh can you imagine <laughs> to, um, to manage and organize a multi-day event in an environment like that yeah with lots of people would be very challenging I would think <laughs> yeah definitely so, so you were feeling sick on your way there how did you feel in the run like did that influence the run do you think like <laughs> so the first day was a 12-hour day um because a lot of the race with Antarctica is about the weather conditions so it's a little bit it's set up a little bit differently to the other ones yeah. because you can only go out for as long as you can so the first day was the first day that they'd had good weather in a long time so they just said just run for as long as you can yeah. so it was a 12-hour day and I thought great as soon as I hit the ice I'll be better mm -hmm. and I wasn't um I got what they called land sick. So essentially every time you take a step, the land comes up to meet you. So I was, it was honestly, it was horrible. <laughs> Sounds um, amazing. But it's amazing what you can do for 12 hours when, you know, you've gone a long way to do it. And mm. um, yeah, so I just kept, kept walking for 12 hours. And I think, folks might be correct me, but I have a feeling very last lap, which was about 7K, I think I ran most of um, just so I could, okay finish yeah and uh and the next day <laughs> that you could run <laughs> yeah got up and did it again um wow. and each day so we had to most days we slept on a boat we had one night where we slept on antarctica on the ice um oh, wow. so but they took us to different different places yeah. and so yeah it was mostly looped courses um and then yeah just got up and did it again the next day and the next day so you went but was there any breaks in the days because of the weather so um, a couple of days we started quite a bit later because they were waiting for that and I think there was one day we might have been, might have had a whole day because we had to go somewhere else because we couldn't um complete just that. we couldn't mm. quite get near where we needed to go to mm. yeah so wow but, so, yeah did you ever go back and do all that again <laughs> was that the the end of, of the uh, what was it called the desert um, the deserts no so I've done those four but they also have what they call a roving race. So okay. every year they also put on a race somewhere else. It's not necessarily a desert. It's just yeah. somewhere else. And um, when I did the Gobi race, I I don't know how it came about. <laughs> Again, probably after a few drinks, um, convinced my brother he should sign up to do this, and he did. So wow. my brother came out to Kashgar and and did the Gobi race with us. Um, and he had a ball. Really enjoyed it. And so. In 2013, maybe 14, 15, I don't know, somewhere around there, um, we all decided that Fergus, my brother, and myself would do it as a team and we'd enter the team event in the Ecuador race. Uh -huh. So we all trained for that, obviously living in different parts of the world, but we trained for that, all met up in Ecuador, in Quito, and, um, and did that race together as a team and oh, just wow. had a had an absolute ball and loved it yeah. so as a team did you all just run together like in the um yep. the 100k walk or was it yep. a real it wasn't yep. a real act? no you did, a, did the whole thing together yeah oh, wow. yeah yeah that's and that amazing. was that was fantastic which we won um which was fabulous so oh, that was awesome. our, yeah, we won that event as a team yeah that was um that was great fun and I think uh yeah, and then we actually went, it's so much fun that we went and did it again in uh, Patagonia a few, couple of years later. Yeah. You're actually, you're making me feel very excited about the whole concept of multi-stage races. I was thinking I'm after like a 60K, that was it. I'm not, I don't have ultras in my world anymore, <laughs> but now you're, you're making me Multi-days oh. are fantastic fun. <laughs> and if you get a great tent, of which we've had a few, um, honestly, they're so much fun. Yeah, and, well, yeah well worth doing. Happen. Mm, yeah. It got me all excited. So, <laughs> what other um, of these crazy long multi-day races have you done? Or is that your um, So in terms of single stage, we living in the UK, we popped over a couple of times to Chamonix and um, we've done the uh, a few of the Chamonix, the Ultra Trail de Mont Blanc races. So um, I started off with the TDS, which I don't think they're running anymore, but that was it was 120K. Yep. And then we did the CCC, um, which is the 100K. And then we did the full 160K, the 100 mile um, UTMB, which is from Chamonix through, yeah, 
Italy, Switzerland, and back to Chamonix. Again. I had a lady who, on the other day. She's going to do the CCC this year. Oh, fabulous! So she's excited yeah. about that. It's such a beautiful course. Yeah, and I think um, Kirsten Maplestone, who I've had on mm-hmm. as well, she does lots of multi-stage ones, and she's done that one. Yeah, the, the longest one of those, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. I, don't, I should know them more, but I don't. But they sound amazing, and you get to travel as at the same time. So yeah, that's, that's the. I think that's the joy of it. Cool. Yeah, going to see so those places with all this um, long distance running that you found yourself doing, sort of almost accidentally. <laughs> it feels like. Um, how did you maintain the training or the the motivation in between time, or do you have you do you find that having a goal, you know, having a race to to head towards has always helped for that yes having a goal helps me I think mostly because of the chronic fatigue um Mm. consistent training has always been very difficult for me so one of the things I think Fergus learned early on was to not tell me that you'll always feel better after a run (laughs) (laughs) because after a few meltdowns um I think I showed that it is not (laughs) always the case for me so it took me a long time to try and figure out what was what was me just being tired yeah and what was me really not in a good place to go for a run because my body wasn't able to cope with it and sometimes that being able to differentiate between that was extremely Mm. hard and I didn't know if Mm. I was being um you know just being a wuss because I just didn't want to go out and being amongst a lot of our friends do run and being amongst other people who were saying you know you always feel better and it's always um, a good thing to do and I love running and I'd be like What's wrong with me because <laughs> I don't always feel better and I don't always enjoy it um so having an event for me is really important because it, it gives me something to aim for so those days when I when I just don't feel like it because I am just tired um mm. that that be the days I go out but it was very difficult and it still is difficult mm. for me to understand sometimes when I shouldn't um, I just think- force myself to do it we talk a little bit on the podcast about that connection between our bodies and our minds mm-hmm. and how um, it's not always that easy. And, you know, you're talking about chronic fatigue, which is an extreme um, side of it, but understanding when our body is saying, oh, it's just a little niggle and it's going to go when you run another two or three K, it'll go, or no, mm-hmm. this is something that's set in and, and it might be the start of an injury. You should be careful. It's not always that easy to determine what's what. It's um, not, no, it's, it's, it's really difficult. And I think even, you know, even even the best runners in the world sometimes would have difficulty with figuring out mm. when it is time they should stop and when they shouldn't. But for me, it's yeah, for me, it's it's taken a long time to try and mm. understand that I don't. There is no one forcing me to do this. Mm-hmm. This is all me. So I, I, a lot of times I used to feel guilty, particularly when you live with someone who's never injured or sick um, <laughs> and loves running. Um, to try and figure out yeah, what is what is wrong with me that this isn't this isn't the same for me mm-hmm. so um yeah. yeah I needed I needed to learn how to just be kinder to myself and to stop that feeling of guilt that I should be out running where I should be doing this whereas but there's no should about it no one's forcing no. me to do it and it's you know we are all different yeah like yeah. we we don't and that, I think we talk a bit about comparisonitis as well, like us comparing yeah. ourselves, whether it's to someone else or our partner who's, you know, obsessed by running more or less than us. We don't have to compare, <laughs> compare ourselves yeah. to them. We can just do, you know, what what we can do and, and listen to our body. It sounds like you've, you've been able to mostly, probably through trial and error. <laughs> Possibly. I think that's probably being very kind. I don't, I'm still not sure I, I get that. Um, one of the, I think one of the best things I did when I moved here was to get a coach. Yeah. And that has been a game changer for me in terms of structuring what I do and why I do it. And to have someone who says, if you, if you are exhausted, don't go, just don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and to have that validation and have someone else saying it's completely okay um, to get permission been, yeah yeah exactly permission from someone else. Yeah. yeah and yet to also have the encouragement and understanding to say well done for doing something that you know when you didn't feel like doing it you yeah. did it really well so. yeah so uh, when did you move to Tassie again when did you move to Australia uh, beginning of 2018 yeah was that a work 
related? Uh, sort of. Um, I c- completed a master's when I was living in London. So mm-hmm. I did a master's in sports nutrition. <laughs> um, a complete a complete change of career. Wow. Um, yeah, I did my master's. And then I just, I absolutely fell in love with research and wanted to do a PhD. And oh, um, one thing led to another, led me to Tasmania. So, so are you studying a PhD am. now? I am, yep. So yep. the interesting thing with that is that, well, it's all very interesting and I want to hear more about it. The But the lady I was talking about before, uh, Gemma, I think, who is going to do the CCC, she's also doing her PhD um, in Queensland at the moment, but um, awesome. not in sports science. <laughs> so yep. else, but anyway, that's what, what are you doing your PhD in? So my, um, my research is investigating the gut and gut damage that athletes have when they're doing particularly high-intensity exercise, but also the relationship with hormones, um, so estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, yep. and you know, the extent to, they, to which they affect that damage that you sustain as an athlete. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. Oh, I'm really mm. interested in that. Oh. <laughs> How long will it take you to do your PhD? Well, it's taken me about four years up till now. Mm-hmm. Um, COVID really um, threw a spanner in the works. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, but I'm hoping to finish by the end of this year. So I'm hoping to have, I'm hoping to have my thesis submitted by about August. Then it'll take a few months to go through the process. But so yeah, obviously hopefully don't, another six months. Doing a master's in the UK, doing a PhD here, there's been a lot of sitting around for you. <laughs> How do you <laughs> My, my work is sitting here in front of this computer if I didn't go for a run. That's really yeah. my point. How do, you, how do you manage all of that, that kind of work? Is this kind of, it's the equivalent of office work, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and the pressures of that, especially PhDs and masters and things, there's a lot of pressure, even if it's mostly your own, yeah. um, to get things done. Because sometimes for me, being a small business owner, I have to really have a conversation with myself that, it's actually important for me to go for my run and fit it in rather than do those 10,000 tasks I think need to be ticked off first, that actually I'll be better at them if I have a run first before. So yeah, how do you, what conversation do you have with yourself, Kate, to make that okay? Well, it, it was difficult. So, so I didn't own a car for 16 years until we moved mm. to Tasmania and then suddenly, and I walked everywhere. Um, mm. So the Masters, it was great because I, it was about a 45 minute walk into the university. So I would walk to and from yeah. um, every day. And that was, that was my exercise. So if I wasn't running, I was walking, um, always, always moving. And then we moved here and it was the house to the car, to the desk, to the car, to the house. <laughs> and I went from doing, you know, 20 to 30,000 steps a day to, uh, sometimes I'd be lucky if I made two. Oh, wow. um, and so I decided to get a bike mm-hmm. and I was living up at Blackstone Heights at the time. And oh. so I started commuting by bike. Um, so that just gave me that extra mm. sort of exercise every day. Um, and then <laughs> Vegas, I seem to be quite suggestible, but Vegas said to me, look, you, do, <laughs> you can run a bit. Um, you've got a bike. Why don't you do a triathlon? So that sounds like a good idea. Again. Actually, and this is what prompted getting the cut. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> all sound like great ideas at the time uh, that's what prompted getting the coaches um I decided to do an Ironman and oh, wow. I had no clue how to fit any of this training in into my life um in terms yeah. of running fine but how do you then fit biking and swimming and all the rest of it so that's that's how I managed to add the additional um sort of time on exercise time was yeah training for an Ironman <laughs> I'm not sure that's exactly what I was expecting you to say. <laughs> and that's why we ask questions and don't just assume because yeah. um, that definitely wasn't what I thought you would say. <laughs> so you've done an Ironman? <laughs> no, I, um, <laughs> I, I've, I tried very badly. I, um, yeah, so I was going, I was planning to do Cairns in 2020, um, mm-hmm. Uh, but that obviously all fell apart. So I did the Coles Bay half mm-hmm. um, and then was going to do Cairns and then that was postponed and I couldn't make it. And then the last couple of years I've had quite a few injuries and illnesses and things. So I had frozen shoulder for about 18 months, so I couldn't even move my arms, so I couldn't uh, swim. Um, that was even difficult to run and ride because of the pain. Um, I've torn a calf muscle. I've just 
had other things go wrong. So now I've got, um, I'm, I'm on a plan to try and do Cairns this year. So I've got, I think it's 15 weeks now <laughs> to get ready. So, I mean, there's nothing like trying to finish a thesis and train for an Ironman all at the same time, but, you know. You're not working at the moment though. Uh, as in an outside job, no. Yeah. Oh, good. No, <laughs> uh, no uh, uh, <laughs> apart from impossible. some of the stuff at the university, yeah. So um, we often do a little bit of teaching, marking, that sort of stuff, but yeah. that's, yeah, yeah, not, yeah. Not, a, not a full-time wow. job or anything. Yeah. That just sounds, uh, it, it still sounds almost impossible, like you like to push yourself. So the question I was going to ask is, you know, what's on the horizon? Obviously, 15 weeks, there's a triathlon <laughs> on the horizon. <laughs> Fingers crossed, anything that happened up until now and then, but it's good to have a plan. So that's my yeah. plan. Yeah. yeah. And then Is after it, that. Yeah. What about after that? You don't know yet? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I guess the things that get you out the door to go do the training because you're, you know, what you do is sedentary mostly at the moment while you're doing yeah. a PhD. Um, is the thought that if I need to train because I'm going to, <laughs> I've got this event that I've entered. And it's a bit scary to turn up to that line without having done the training. That's yeah. what I'm hearing. So you've got a triathlon coach? Yes, I do. Yep, yep, yep. Dylan Hill, he is the oh, most yeah. amazingly patient. <laughs> um, he's been fantastic. Yeah, I, I could have asked for someone better to be helping me through this. Yeah. And do you find having a husband who is also, you know, into the similar kinds of exercise regimes as you, He's been, has, you know, been really helpful and supportive. Oh, completely. Um, and I think a lot of our, uh, I think until maybe 2019, I went overseas for a conference um, for, as part of my PhD. Um, up until then, I think from the time that we met till then, I don't think we'd been on a holiday that hadn't been <laughs> running related. <laughs> so most of the holidays we had were around races. And I love that. And I think having someone to do that with is a great motivation to keep training and keep fit so that you're able to do that. Yeah. Um, so a lot of those times when I just didn't feel like it, that idea that if, if I don't do this, then we can't do the thing that we want to do together. Um, so, yeah, that was really good motivation to make sure that I could get out the door and go. I mean, if I could do events without having to train for them, I'd be all in for <laughs> You do like because some people, I particularly, the older I've got actually, the more anxious I find I am at the start line of something. And the longer it is, the more anxious I like the longer the race, the more anxious yeah. I am. So I've even started avoiding racing. <laughs> oh gosh. Just go out training is I'm almost prefer to train, except when you don't have the goal of a race to aim for, I'm also you know, oh, I don't really, I don't have to go out today because, <laughs> or whatever. I So now I try to encourage myself with things like somewhere new to run or a podcast to listen to or something. So some other reason to go that's not related to a race that I might be training for just because of the nervousness. So it's interesting mm -hmm. that you, um, for you, you'd rather just do the race and without all the training. So it's kind of the opposite, which is. Yeah, I, I very rarely get nervous before a race. Mm -hmm. um, I I, I will get much more nervous before training. I, oh, yeah. I get very <laughs> anxious. It's it's a very weird thing. Um, there's a thing in me that always thinks, oh, I don't know if I can do this, which is completely insane. But, yeah, I I am much more comfortable just turning up to a race and just going, yeah. <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> Whatever happens will happen. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah. Wow. That is fascinating because it's completely different from how my brain went. Mm. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, do, when do you think you first called yourself a runner? So that's a question I ask people often. You know, I I don't think I... I, I don't know is the answer. Um, I probably skipped the whole runner thing and I think it was probably other people that called me an ultra runner first. Mm -hmm. So that was probably after having done a few races, people would introduce me and or Fergus and say oh you know these are my friends these are the crazy people that go out and do ultra marathons these are ultra runners so I'm and I've never done I've never done a marathon I've never I've, I've done one half marathon which was the Cadbury mm -hmm. one a couple of years ago um I've never done a 5k 10k like yeah. so I'm not I don't feel that I'm a a runner of deserving of that because I don't 
run I don't do those races you didn't, so. you didn't sort of go the normal 5k 10k 21 <laughs> 42 <laughs> no <laughs> no and I've run yeah I've run plenty of those distances in training I just so cool. never sort of recognized official races yeah. so I don't yeah I think it was probably other people that identified me as a runner before mm-hmm. I felt comfortable saying that that was I did and most of that again goes back to that sort of crank there have been a lot of times where I've had long periods of running because I've just not been well enough. Um, and there are days, weeks, but getting out of bed, just functioning mm. has been difficult. So um, possibly because it's not been a consistent thing in my life always that, I, I, yeah, I just, I didn't, I, know, I just didn't feel deserving of the term runner because I just, <laughs> you know, I run a bit. <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes for five yeah. days in a row. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Across lots and lots of case. Um, how long do you think you'll have this in your life, whether it's running or just the distance type of stuff? Yeah. Hmm. Oh, look, I think as long as I'm finding it fun, um, hmm. which hopefully is forever. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I, it's we often joke that I'm, I'm never going to be the fastest person. I'm never going to win anything. But, you know, one day I might be the oldest person that does something. Um, I might be happy with that. <laughs> so yeah, as, as long as I can keep doing it, would be would be great. I would. I I can't imagine myself not being active and yeah, doing something, so that, um, whether moving. that's running or whatever. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Mm. Um, so I guess your identity then is is mixed around the fact that you're an active person, mm-hmm. whether it's running or some other kind of way to move or uh, mountain climbing, <laughs> all that kind yep. of stuff. Um, so. What's happened in those times, I suppose you can speak to this quite well, actually, when you can't run, say, the chronic fatigues um, got a hold of you for, for a period of time. How does that feel mentally? Like, do you, how do you deal with that? Is that quite a challenge for you? I mean, I assume it is a challenge, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's definitely a challenge. And I'm still not sure I'm any better at dealing with it mm. than I ever used to be. Yeah. Um, it's frustrating because I'll, usually it comes at a time where I've been doing some training that's been really good and I've been feeling good and you know I feel like I'm improving and then and then it'll just hit me and I kind of wipe out or I get really sick like I'm like a three-year-old at nursery I get everything that goes around um so I yeah I it's 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 frustration I think more than anything is that I feel like I've improved and then just yeah get knocked back then have to start again I feel like I'm often starting again from scratch it's like two steps back, one step forward kind of thing sometimes when it's, yeah. when it's around. So yeah. do you find, though, that your running, just for could be other sports now that you're doing cycling and swimming as well, um, are part, do, do they help keep it at bay sometimes? Or is that that goes back to that listening to your body a bit, like we've said before, and maybe not pushing it on those days when your body's trying to give you a signal not to, and that's how you can sort of keep it at bay a bit? Yeah, and I think one of the one of the important thing that Dylan's kind of teaching me, and I'm a very slow learner, <laughs> is that consistency is more important than really hard efforts. And you know, we've got limited time now for me to train for Cairns, mm-hmm. and he is far more interested in me trying to keep consistent mm-hmm. and having gentler weeks rather than a really good solid week of training and then a week yeah. where I can't do anything so yeah. um, I'm really really trying to learn to, to try and maintain that consistency mm-hmm. rather than I feel great so I'm going to go for it and then the yeah. next day can't get out of bed yeah yeah that, that mm-hmm. makes sense yeah I like that that's a really good mm-hmm. advice as well isn't it to everybody actually yeah um because often especially new runners they go and blokes in particular <laughs> tend to go just like flat out and then they hurt themselves after a month of running and they don't yeah. run again for another month or something because they've yeah. got an injury so that's uh, it's interesting um with your training are you mostly training by yourself at the moment are you training yeah with yeah your- mostly yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. um Occasionally, so on Saturday mornings, I run with Dylan's group, um, run group on a Saturday morning, Mm -hmm. Um, but pretty much during the week, yeah, by myself. I love getting out for a run with Fergus if he's got an easy run. Um, Then we tend to go together, but otherwise, yeah, most of it's by myself. So do you spend a lot of time listening to things or do you run without things or train? Not just running. (laughs) Um, a, A bit of both. So sometimes listen to music. I used to listen to a lot of podcasts when I was running, but because running's been not 
so much. Um, lately, I haven't been doing that. Um, if I'm on the bike, occasionally I'll just have one earphone in with a bit of music if it's a really long ride. But I'm conscious that the Iron Man, there's no you can't have um, any iPods yeah. or anything. Yeah, so I'm quite happy not to go. Um, I used to, I never used to really run with anything, but when I was in London, um, particularly the um, the number of comments, calls, you know, all the rest of it that you used to get, um, I just found it easy to have earphones in, even if there wasn't anything on them. So <laughs> even now, even now I still run with earphones, but I might not be actually listening to anything. It's just to block out. So people like, well, she's not, she's not going to respond because she's got headphones in. She can't hear me anyway. Yeah, and that was a bit of a safety thing too because wow. if, if you're not running with your phones and, you yeah. know, some blokes would be calling something, if you didn't respond, they'd be, mm. that would make them more aggressive. So, wow. um, you know, what are you too good to talk to us sort of a thing. So at yeah. least if you've got earphones in, there's an excuse not to hear them, even yeah. if you could hear them. <laughs> um, and then so, the yeah, it's a bit, it just depends on them. Only like thing, not yeah. having anything... Um, not having any sound in there, at least you can hear. <laughs> so so you kind of the exactly. double-edged sword. Yeah. I've, I've always run with one. Even now while I'm listening to you, I've only got one ear. It's just a habit now. Yeah. Probably have no hearing at all in this ear that I always have it's... something in. <laughs> the other ear, ear is fine. <laughs> it's just the one I have the, the headphone in, which is weird. <laughs> um, what, you don't have to give me any detail, of course, but what sort of things do you think you're thinking about when you're doing all this training? Um, what sort of things are going through your mind? Uh, I guess for me, it's just whatever's going on at the time. So I think about my thesis a lot. Um, I'm always working through something. Um, at the moment, I'm doing a lot of writing. So I'm, I'm just working through how I'm going to say things. Yeah, um, yeah how I'm going to write it. That, so that that is a lot. Um, yeah. Sometimes I don't think about much at all. Yeah. Sometimes it's just nice to be. Yeah. Does it feel like... like for me, because you know, having a small business and everything, I have the best ideas when I'm running. But sometimes when I stop running, they don't seem that good at all. And they just were good while I was out running. <laughs> so I wonder sometimes when you're thinking about your writing, that's what made me think of it. I'm like, sometimes I think of really good things I'm going to write down in a book or something I'm doing. And then when I go to write it down, as soon as I finish my run, I'm like, oh, actually, that's not as good as I thought it was. <laughs> that's happened to me a lot so I, I used to when I was running on trails I used to because I'd often take my phone with me just in a pack or something um and I'd, I'd actually put on the voice recorder and I'd say what it was that I yeah. was thinking so I'd be running along talking to my phone to record it because I was yeah. like I can't forget this because guaranteed I will if I don't so I used to do that a lot um and then I'd get back to my desk I'd be listening to it thinking what <laughs> what dribble was that <laughs> thank you <laughs> um but occasionally there were some really good ideas that just yeah, I just up. have come up with, yeah, just, you know, and just clarifies your thought. You're just like, oh, yeah. that's what I've been missing or whatever. And then you can get back and do it. So yeah. so in this very busy time that we have, this is a personal question. How do you, <laughs> how do you find, um, how do you focus? Like to do a master's and a PhD, something that I've been fascinated in myself over the last few years. I just wonder with our very crazy world that we have, you know, there's so many distractions um, for me, going for a run or or even meditating is the only time that I actually have less distraction around me. Um, how do how do you deal with that? Because you really need to focus if you're doing you know those tasks that you set yourself. How do you do that? What's your secret? I think there are always days where it's hard to focus, and there are days where you know you sit down and just you know I'm going to write this, and at the end of the day you've written a whole sentence. <laughs> And that's a win. Um, but for the most part, I I love what I do. I I am I, I want to answer the questions that I have. I want to learn about this. I just I want to do this. So for me, it's once I'm in that headspace, I can yeah, I can focus very well. So it's not unusual for me to sit down at the computer. You know, if I start work at seven thirty or eight o'clock in the morning, and suddenly it's twelve, and I haven't I haven't got up from my seat. I haven't moved. I've just been that's working. Awesome. So. Um, those days are great it's not always like that yeah yeah I just think loving what I do just really does help yeah yeah I love that and that what you said before too having the question like having a quest the questions you want answered and then the way to answer it is it, through the processes that you've set yourself um the PhD and things yeah, yeah. I love it I'm going to use that that's awesome thank you um, <laughs> okay so Kate um mm. 
is there, what do you think your life would be like if you hadn't taken up, you know, running? It feels hard to just say running to you because I feel like I should be saying mountain climbing, running, triathlon. <laughs> like, what would your life be like if you weren't so active, do you think? What would it be missing? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think it's probably three things. I think first would be the most amazing group of bonkers friends that we've ever <laughs> met. Um, we've just we've just met so amazing many people throughout the world who are just doing the craziest things and loving it. And wherever we go, there's always people that we know that are that are doing stuff and to be able to catch up with people around the world who we just we just get on with so well it has been it's really enriched my life I think just knowing these people um I think secondly just in terms of meeting people my brother coming along to Gobi um gave me an opportunity to to meet him again so yeah. when kind of when we left school we got on with our lives and then I went overseas we didn't we're always close as a family, but we never, as I said, I am shocking at keeping in touch with people. And <laughs> so we'd see each other if I came back to Australia, but we didn't really, we weren't close. We were good friends, but we weren't close. And I think him coming and having done these races with us, and we've done quite a few races now throughout the world, and he's come to visit and it gave me an opportunity to, to learn about my brother again and, and become a lot closer to him. So that's been fantastic and I wouldn't have had that otherwise I think that's beautiful um, yeah. yeah and I think probably the third thing would be just the opportunity to go to places that I would never have been to if it wasn't for a race so you know it's just some spec or, or indeed some event or climbing or whatever just just some yeah travel amazing places and to experience them on on foot I on think foot has yeah places that you, element, you cannot it? yeah you cannot get yeah. to any other way um, except on foot and yeah it's such a special thing to do that's beautiful mm -hmm. all right Kate do you think there's mm -hmm. anything about running that we haven't mentioned that we should have <laughs> oh, so many things um <laughs> <laughs> we just need a part two a whole podcast yeah. about all the things we haven't talked about, about <laughs> yeah look oh oh so many things and I think I think that is the joy of running though is that it's not just one thing it's yeah it's so many things and it's so many distances and it's so many places and it's so many people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you could talk forever about it because it's just, it's so huge that yeah. I don't know how do you distill it down into a little conversation. You could do it in a PhD. Yeah. <laughs> like four or five years. <laughs> That's how amazing it is. So I guess um, I'll, we, I might get you on again, actually, in the future. I'm very interested in, in your PhD as well. And I think I'm sure there'll be lots of other um, runners who'd be interested in it too. So it'd be fascinating to talk about. Um, but we'll wrap today up by asking you if you've got any tips for beginner runners. Oh, this is a hard one. Um, I, I, I would say probably, I, I'm guessing a lot of people have given this out. So it's just to enjoy it don't don't do it because you feel you have to don't do it because anyone tells you you should just do it because you enjoy it mm -hmm. um and find your find your why and that that why might be different every day but yep. just find your why for doing it but um it, sh it should be fun it should be enjoyable it's it's a great thing to do um and just yeah and don't go too hard <laughs> <laughs> yes, do not go too hard. So many, yeah. I think you know you were saying before, Blake's particularly, you'll go out and just hit it, and then I'll be like, oh, um, yeah. I've got friends who've gone for a run. They're like, that was terrible. <laughs> it's like, yeah, because you tried to kill yourself. Exactly. Um, so just take it easy and be gentle. And and ultimately, at some point, if you don't know what you're doing, find an expert. There are mm. lots of different ways of getting coaching out there that. Um, that aren't expensive we'll spend far more a week on coffee than we do on getting expert help and um yeah. you know it's not cheating to have a coach it's not um one of the reasons I didn't get a coach earlier was because I didn't think I was worth it I didn't think mm -hmm. I deserved one I, I wasn't a runner I wasn't going fast I wasn't going to win anything so on earth did I need a coach and that was completely the wrong way to think about it um, and it wasn't really until I did it like a personal training certificate and 
I was like, of course you would get a personal trainer. Well, it's no different to getting a coach, someone that can teach you, show you, help you, support you. Um, yeah, one of the best things you could do. So, mm, yeah. That's good advice. I love it. Thank you, Kate. It has been just amazing to get to know you. I really enjoyed our conversation and I know that everyone listening to it is going to enjoy it as well. So thank you for sharing your time and wisdom and inspiration with us. Thank you for having a chat with me. I really enjoyed that. <laughs> Excellent. That's what I like to hear. All right. I will um, end the recording, but I'll have a chat with you after the recording. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Kate. Okay. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you for listening to the Fit Mind, Fit Body podcast. I'd love to talk to you about your running journey. So send me a message on Facebook or on the website and let's do it. For a bunch of resources on mindful running that will help you get and stay mentally and physically fit, head over to the website fitmindfitbody.co and I'll see you there. Plus, I'll be back here in your podcast player a few times a week. Hit subscribe now so that you don't miss an episode. And before you go, I'd really appreciate it if you'd leave a review. It'll help more people to find the podcast and get inspired to start running. I'll see you soon. Bye.